Okay, thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be back uh, to the 14th Ward Independent Club. In 2020, Mike Doyle and I had a friendly primary and I spoke uh, then. So uh, I'm Jerry Dickinson and I am a constitutional law professor at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, statistically speaking, I probably shouldn't be here today running for Congress. I was born here in Pittsburgh. I was born to a black father and a white mother. Both were far too poor and too sick to take care of me. I was placed in the Allegheny County foster care system at a very early age. I bounced around to some shelters and then landed in a large foster home out in Shaler Township. A white couple from McKeesport had moved out to Shaler, had two kids of their own, and opened up their small ranch house as an emergency at-risk foster shelter. Eleven children altogether came into that foster home, including me. White kids and black kids, and teenagers and toddlers all coming from broken homes and tragic circumstances. And they did all they could to take care of us. They gave us food, a roof over our head, but sometimes trauma and distress is too much to overcome. We've all dealt with uh, issues related to poverty and addiction, mental health, incarceration, homelessness and joblessness. This is the world that I come from. This is the world uh, that, I'm, uh, that I was born into. Somehow I made it out okay. I worked hard. I came, overcame a lot of obstacles. I got good grades in college and went on to become a division one athlete in college at the College of Holy Cross. I became a Fulbright Scholar to Johannesburg, South Africa, and then a tenured law professor at the University of Pittsburgh at the age of 32. So not too bad for a poor black foster kid. But my proudest accomplishment is none of those things. It's my two daughters, Aria Nyla, and my wife, Emily Dickinson, who's not the poet. And so when I'm looking at the world that my two daughters are growing up in, and Emily, I think about January 6th of 2021. I'm looking at the world that we're gonna be leaving behind for my two daughters. And I'm thinking about climate change and rising sea levels and wildfires. I'm thinking about the Pittsburgh that my two daughters are growing up in as the least livable region for African-American women. And I'm thinking about the Pittsburgh that they're inheriting where they could be going across the bridge at any moment and that bridge collapses due to failed government. And they're growing up in a world where a nation state is invading another democratic nation state over in Ukraine and Russia right now. That's the world my daughters are growing up in. And that's why I'm stepping aside from my career as a law professor to run for Congress. This is what has inspired me to represent tenants for 10 years in eviction proceedings to keep a roof over their head as a civil rights lawyer, to fight for fair housing for the disabled and the elderly here in Pittsburgh, to go to South Africa through the State Department to fight on behalf of squatters in inner city slums of Johannesburg, South Africa, to come back here to Pittsburgh to work on police reform efforts right here in Pittsburgh to talk about and teach about the fragility of our constitution at the University of Pittsburgh, and now to go down to Washington DC to fight for voting rights to save our democracy, to fight for the money from the infrastructure package to make sure that our roads and our bridges are safe, to fight for climate change, to fight for Medicare for all, to bring those things here to Pittsburgh. Why? Because this is where I come from, to work on behalf of those who have less than, to work on behalf of those who who treat it as less than because that's where I come from. That is who I am. So statistically speaking, I shouldn't be here today, but I'm here and I'm running to become your next Congressman. Thank you so much. All right, questions. Yes. Sure. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Education is a, an important part of my life, including Emily. Emily is a teacher for the deaf at Western Pennsylvania School for the Deaf and Early Childhood Education. So uh, public school is extremely important. I'm a product of the public school system here in Western Pennsylvania. I went to Shaler High. Uh, I was the class president at Shaler High. I beat Al Gore by 12 votes. I kid you not. His name was Alexander Gore, and I beat him by 12 votes in the senior year. Uh, so uh, big fan of public schools. I want to do all we can to ensure that charter schools are not taking money away from our public schools. Right now we see that happening across the United States. That's a huge problem, huge gap in funding problems, and that's a, that's a major problem. Now, are charter schools going away? Probably not. They're here, and so we have to deal with that. How do we deal with that problem? We are going to have to force charter schools to have the same accountability mechanisms and measures as our public schools. That means for testing and standards and teachers, those standards need to be the same as public schools. We need to, uh, you know, bring some equity in that, in that realm. So uh, certainly I would like to put more uh, dollars from the um, U.S. Department 
Department of Education into public schools, and Congress would have a role to play to place more restrictions on charter schools so that they are not stripping money away from our public schools and from, to be quite honest, uh, my children and many of our children here. So thank you. Yes, yes. Yep, uh, because we have, so, so, say it again, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, how, how can Democrats come together with uh, a coherent message uh, for the party and for the voters. This is a big problem. The Democrats, we, when you think about the, the policies that we, that we um, throw up uh, for elections every year, it's like a huge buffet of, of, of options, right? I mean, it's like, it's Medicare for all, it's healthcare, it's, it's climate change, it's police reform, it's criminal justice reform. And for a lot of, that's a lot to have to absorb, but right? that's a lot of um, um, policy mechanisms. We need to narrow the scope of our message. And, uh, and we also need to be able to story tell better. Right now in Congress, there are a lot of Democrats who are not able to story tell and, and explain how certain policies are affecting ordinary people, ordinary Americans who are struggling day by day, paycheck by paycheck. So a couple of things I will say heading into 2022 and 2024. One very important message that can be brought to the forefront, and we know this could, could work, is that Democrats need to take hold of voting rights as a major, major message, because we're going into 2024, an election where Republicans are preparing to potentially overturn another election. If we can get people to understand that voting rights is very important, that's going to be important. And then health care reform, a message that can resonate with a broad swath of people across socioeconomic and, uh, and race, that we we need to talk about healthcare reform and how it is affecting our pockets, how it is affecting those uh, prescription drug prices, how it's affecting my parents, uh, both of whom have struggled with ischemic stroke and, a pan and pancreatic cancer, both of them had their savings stripped away from them due to healthcare costs, okay? And that's happening to people all across the United States right now. And if we can bring that message and, 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 and simplify it for people, I think the Democrats are gonna be in a much better position. And then lastly, Democrats like to talk about aspirational things. We wanna achieve this and we wanna achieve that and we wanna achieve this, that's fine. But we also have to talk about what we've actually achieved what results we've actually brought to the forefront. And we have not done a good job at doing that. When I'm in Congress, I hope to be able to uh, uh, press that message forward. So thank you. Yes, yes Tracy. Yes, authoritarianism. I mean, this is why we almost had a free and fair election overturned for the first time in American history in 2021. From a legislative standpoint to deal with this authoritarianism, there's a couple of things that have to be done immediately. Many of you remember January 6th of 2021, the certification of the election was thrown up for a vote. One of the biggest problems we have in this country is the Electoral College Act of 1887. The threshold for, for throwing a free and fair election up is one House member has to object and one U.S. Senator has to object. And it goes straight to Congress to vote on whether to overturn an election. That is problematic. And so when I'm in Congress, what I plan to do is work alongside Jamie Raskin and pass a piece of legislation to increase the threshold to 50 members of each House in order to object to an election so that doesn't happen. Secondly, the vice president should never be the ceremonial person to deal with the certification. Mike Pence literally almost had the chance to overturn the election. We need to remove the president, vice president from that process and have the president pro tempore as part of that. And then a number of other things that have to happen. Uh, the gerrymandering problem is a big issue for authoritarianism. So I would propose that Congress pass a piece of legislation that bans gerrymandering across the United States. The federal government preempts all the states that are gerrymandering, and they are required to go through the federal government to do this. So those are a couple of things to deal with the authoritarian problem, and uh, I look forward to doing that as a constitutional law professor uh, in Congress. And I think results, results, results. Progressive platitudes are fine. Talking about aspirational things are great. We're going to have to need someone, have someone in Congress who can actually go on on day one and get things done from the very beginning that's really important so thank you